Welcome to Unearthly Upstate. This is Mari. And I am Matthew. And we're continuing with our October ha- Halloween special. I don't know if you want to call that. <laughs> and we're going to Rochester and yes. we're going to visit the, a grave of a man. At in, the Holy Sepulchre Cemetery. At the Holy Sepulchre Cemetery, yes. Mm-hmm. And this particular man, um, he was a charlatan. He was a quack doctor. Uh, He had a few run-ins with the law. And uh, we have our Halloween kitty, Ori, jumping around. So if you hear anything, that's her. What you'd call a confidence trickster? Uh, Not so much confidence trickster. I'm going to lean more towards snake oil salesman. Okay, all right, all right. right. But those those terms are going to come up later on. I I want to expand. I want to... Confidence trickster, trickster is <laughs> a, a, a purveyor of uh, questionable uh, treatments for questionable outcomes of acti- certain activities. So we say he's out there peddling Doctor Flincher's snake oil. You know, yeah. Type, you know, yes. Lin- liniments. <laughs> so why is this grave of this snake oil salesman so important? Why? Why, why are we stopping there? Well, because, uh-huh. dear listeners. In Rochester, New York, there might be Jack the Ripper. <laughs> yes, he. This particular man named Doctor, and we use the term loosely. <laughs> Francis Trump Trumpelty Trumpelty Trumpelty. Trumble-a-tea. Trumble-a-tea. Yes. Trumble-a-tea. I knew I missed the B. Trumble-a-tea. Trumble-a-tea. Okay. Dr. Francis Trumble-a-tea. Trumble-a-tea. At your service. Uh, is one of the people that has been noted that may be Jack the Ripper, and he even was a suspect at one point during the investigation of Jack the Ripper. So he's a pretty good candidate. Mm-hmm. Um, I, we'll go through a timeline with this guy. Like I said... He was a bit of a, a bit of a con, you know. But he was uh, a bit of a see him next Tuesday. Yes. Yeah. Now I I don't think we have to go and we should go over the quick thumbnail of Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper, of course, is the famous killer from Whitechapel, who in uh, 1888, I believe it was. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, between um, August. End of August 1888 and the beginning of November of 1888 killed five women in Whitechapel. These were horrific attacks. Most of these women were prostitutes, and the attacks were quite vicious. Um, Body parts removed. Uh, They were done. What really is intriguing about it is how quickly they were killed, and in such some of them in such public areas as well. Right but, in front of your door. Yeah, but uh, I'm not going to go into the full detail how Jack the Ripper got away with it. Just say, just say Whitechapel at that time, a lot of crime, a lot of people looking the other way, not a safe place to be. Um, mm-hmm. And women who were in situations like these women were really had no other choice mm-hmm. to be in the lifestyle they were, and they were putting their lives in danger. And Fallen you know, women. Fallen I, women, I believe, yeah. Uh, this was the yep. correct term back in the day. So... And, yeah. That was our Jack the Ripper thumbnail. <laughs> uh-huh. Definitely, we're not here to discuss the full Jack the Ripper case, mm-hmm. but we are going to talk about Trumble T and how he is possibly Jack the Ripper. Now, mm-hmm. we have to start, well, he, his story starts back in Ireland. Mm-hmm. He was born in 1833 in Ireland. Mm-hmm. Not much more information with, other than that. But in 1847, he immigrated with his family to Rochester, New York. Uh, they came aboard what was called a coffin ship, and that was yeah. Expand a little bit okay. on the, the definition of a coffin ship. That was the term they gave to the uh, ships that were bringing over the refugees, mainly from Ireland, due to the potato famine. And you remember, oh, you if you've been listening to our podcast a long time, uh, you know the. The Germans that came over the German flats, how they they were refugees and how they had been treated, and the uh, indentured Irish servants uh, who mm-hmm. came over during the Revolutionary War and how they were treated. Well, this was another extension of that. They were pretty much uh, pushed into these ships. It was cheap passage. 
Um, if they were lucky, there was food and water available mm-hmm. for them. Yeah. Uh, disease was rampant, so that, that's why they were called coffin ships. So many people died on the passage over. But they were, I guess it was one of these you know, uh, between a rock and a hard place type situations because so many people were dying in Ireland at the time. So you were taking a chance. So if you could afford yeah. to embark on a ship and get out of Ireland and go to the United States where there's a chance. A chance. Better and, chance uh, of survival. Better chances, but uh, your only chance would probably be to work in the Erie Canal. Uh, but, <laughs> hey. Uh, yeah, I, hey, I possibly. Yeah. A, a lot of respect uh, to yeah. my, my Irish and German cousins. Yeah. You know, for building the Erie Canal. Mm-hmm. You know, the, hey, that thing was built with Irish backs and German stone. Yeah. So, you know, uh, and... Well, uh, to circle it back you mm-hmm. know, to this immigration in '47, what was going on at the time in, in, well, in was, America? You know, well in America, I don't. Well, in Ireland, it was the potato famine mainly. Well, I mean, and, yeah, there was a lot of uh, expansion into the New West, right? Which was the what became the Old West. But, and also, yeah. um, just one more thing: that not just the potato famine was going through, but also the Highland clearances happened. So you had a lot of um, Scots. And the highlands yeah. being pushed uh-huh. onto these ships as well. So it wasn't just uh-huh. the Irish. All right. True. Okay. So, yeah. So they pretty much, these people were, were expected to die. But his family made it over, and he made it over to Rochester. New York is where they settled. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of interesting you mentioned the Erie Canal, because it makes me wonder if that's why his family settled there. Uh, you know, it's not that far from the canal. Uh, but um, he was about 14. When he moved in, but when he when mm-hmm. turned seventeen, he started to work with a herb doctor. And I'm gonna—that's the term that was given. This uh, we would call them naturopaths, or uh, what's some of the other terms? Uh, the ones who uh, they make a tincture with a little bit homeopaths. Yeah. You know. Okay, you mean? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, like homeopaths, naturopaths, things of those nature. Uh, but that's what a herb doctor was. They they believed in just uh, treating you with herbs. The thing is, uh, a lot of these herb doctors, or famous Indian herb doctors, as a lot of them called themselves, uh, really had no clue what they were doing and just would mix things up and give it to you and hope for the best, really, and yeah. take your money. Uh, and he started working with one in particular who was producing cures for, uh, shall we say, embarrassing diseases from a promiscuous nature. Syphilis? <laughs> <And>, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he was using uh, Francis to... Okay, uh, we- we just got banned from half the algorithm. Yeah, I <laughs> just saying that. Um, no, this one probably will have to have an explicit <laughs> label because of some of the things we have to discuss. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, is as nice as we're going to discuss it. Yeah, I might think so. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so he was uh, helping uh, hand out pamphlets uh, to, to sell this doctor's wares. And these pamphlets, uh, they were medical. I in nature, suppose they had medical terms in them. Uh, they kind of were explicit in their illustrations. So it's it, they're porn. Okay, they're just porn. <laughs> and, <laughs> look so some, look at some naughty parchments. So, so basically, that's what we do. He was handing out porn and you know telling mm-hmm. people, "Hey, go check with this guy if you need some assistance." So, uh, that was his first job. And then he got uh, started working with this guy named Rudolph Lyons, who uh, set up an office in Rochester. And he called himself the well-known and celebrated Indian herb doctor. Well, Francis Trumberly, Trumble T, sorry, uh, was really like, this is it. This is my calling. So he became kind of the guy's apprentice for a bit. And in 1855, Francis... It, moved to Detroit, and set himself up as a famous Indian herb doctor. Ooh. And he was selling things like Trumbull Tea's Pimple Destroyer and Dr. Moreau's Indian Root Pills. The Pimple Destroyer, I think that's my favorite. <laughs> um, but he, like I said, he would, 
you know, mix the stuff up. And if, you know, if somebody died, he would just take off and go somewhere else. Which is, you know, and he ended up going through Canada. He ended up going back to Rochester for a bit. But he had some money at this point. He was making good money doing this. Uh, And then he ended up in... New York City, about nineteen six. Sorry, eighteen sixty. S- selling, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Selling his tinctures. Yes. So, yeah. And uh, eighteen sixty. What happens in, in the eighteen sixties, Matt? Well, you know, we have the American Civil War. Yes. Uh, that's one of the major events. And uh, Do- uh, it was McKellen, I believe. He was. Uh, he wanted to impress himself upon. The Union. So he, in 1861, he moves to D.C. He wants to give his support to the Union troops. Mm -hmm. And he really starts trying to work on McKellen. Now, which McKellen am I talking about? Talking about, talking about General George B. McKellen. McClellan? McClellan, yes. Sorry. And he was trying to impress him. Uh, Selling Dr. Bludgeon Brain's cranial edifice? <laughs> no, now he was trying to, tr- um, Trumbull T was trying to promote himself as a skilled surgeon. Have you noticed I never mentioned he went to medical school at this point? Yeah, nobody's asked him for his credentials quite yet. Well, that was the thing, though. He was trying to get in with the Union Army as a surgeon, as brutal and as uh, uh, barbaric the so- medical practices seem to us, they did at least want you to have a little bit of actual training. <laughs> yeah, and there were all uh, some outfits where yeah. uh, you'd have to look up this specifically, re- yeah. listeners. But I think some outfits were also offering ten dollars an amputation, something crazy like yeah. that. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, you run over a lot of stuff when you're reading these articles, right? Um, and supposedly at this time, um, this is hearsay. There's mm. been no real proof of this. It was just uh, some people mentioned this in their memoirs years later. Uh, one way to impress upon the Union generals uh, that he would be a good surgeon is he would host uh, informative dinner parties, I mm-hmm. guess you would call them, uh, in <laughs> which he would present you know, how what good he was. And supposedly at a couple of these dinner parties, he would bring out a collection of particular body parts. And like you said, we're about to have to go explicit, so he had pickled uter- uteruses. Jars of pickled, pickled uteruses. uteruses. Yes. Hmm. Um, and it, and it's a good, good time to mention that it was also known at this point, and it was starting to mention by other people, especially talking, he had a special hatred for women. Um, which is going to be kind of an interesting twist at, when we start talking about could he or could he Jack the Ripper. Uh, but mm-hmm. he really did not like women. He had some interesting reasons for it. He really hated prostitutes. I mean, he just thought they were lower than dirt and dog shit. Oh, there goes the E again. <laughs> again sorry. Uh and I thought I was going to be the one. <laughs> Surprise you. Um, I'm going to pour myself another glass of wine then. <laughs> okay. Can't pause it, so I'll keep talking. Go on. So, anyway, he... So, these rumors of him with these pickled uteruses... Oh, I'm so sorry. And... Okay, so as I was saying before Matt dropped his microphone, <laughs> uh, so he had these collections of uteruses. He had this really distaste for women. Um, as for the collections of uteruses, where did he get them? Was there this trail of missing women? That's never been proven. Uh, you also have to remember at this time there was a lot of uh, grave digging and grave robbing going on. So if he was trying to present himself as a doctor, he might have been paying people mm-hmm. for these. Right. Going into freshly dug graves and getting them. So uh, I, I don't think if you're going to use that as a proof that he was already killing women, mm-hmm. uh, I don't think that's a good proof because there were other ways that they were procuring these. But it was also a way that he was trying to show that he was a good surgeon. Mm-hmm. Remember, no right. medical training at all. 
And we'd, we'd like to thank you right now for helping mm -hmm. us keep this subject a little bit of light with uh, yeah. some antics here over at Honestly <laughs> Upstate. Yes. Right. Like We've we got to find some way of keeping it light. Like Matt knocking over his, <laughs> his microphone as he reached for his glass of wine. Okay. <laughs> uh, but on May 5th in 1865, he was arrested, right, in yeah. St. Louis and uh, taken oh, yeah. to Washington. Oh, no, you jumped ahead. So, yes. So, but because I was already on the on the on the subject of the, well, the dinner parties. Okay. Well, the dinner parties. So <laughs> he did not get a commission with the Union Army. Obviously, <laughs> okay. they did his research and they went. This guy does not have a medical degree. He's not even served as a nurse. And so then he said, "Okay, fine. I'm a in famous Indian herb doctor." <laughs> Well, yeah. somehow, and this is not too clear in any of the stuff I've found, and maybe somebody who's really studied him could explain this a little more. Uh -huh. As you were saying, uh, in 18, May 5th, 1865, he's arrested. Abraham Lincoln had been shot. Right. And had died. Uh -huh. And they were trying to find all the conspirators, and somehow his name got mixed up into that. And that's why he was arrested. Oh, he was okay. arrested in St. Louis and taken to Washington uh, because he was supposedly assisted in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. On orders of the uh, Secretary of War. Yes. Uh, he was supposedly an associate of David Harold, who was caught with w Wilkes Booth. Okay. Oh. But Trumbull Trumbull denied any dis denied any association, and really they had no proof. Okay. So he was released at the end of May for that. Uh, nine years later, we get proof of him in Liverpool, England. So now he's making the trips across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And in Liverpool, England, he again sets himself up as an herb doctor. Uh, only in this case, now it's not the Far East Indian herbs. These are the Native American herbs. So, you know. Right. And I think that was one of the first times one of his tinctures killed somebody. Uh-oh. And he had to run out of the country to escape that. Uh, he a few it happens a few times. He either kills or severely injures somebody with his medicine, and he takes off. It's a pretty common uh, thing throughout his life. Right. And he just sets up himself up in another city, advertises himself as this wonderful herb doctor who's got these great you know tinctures for you and these pimple poppers or whatever it was for. Her. <laughs> Something to do with boils, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, and it probably made it worse. Yep, but he it did nothing at all. He starts going back and Best. forth from England to America quite a bit. And in 1881, he was arrested in New Orleans for pickpocketing. So I guess at some points he really wasn't making the money. Like that, that's what it sounds <laughs> like. But then in 1881, in May, he moved to London, Whitechapel. Mm. Now well, it wasn't. Wait, wasn't it 1888? Oh, sorry, 1888. Thank you. Okay, okay. Yeah, he moved to Whitechapel, London. Now, uh, he, again, sets himself up as this herb doctor. Mm. Um, he was claiming that he knew Charles Dickens. He knew King William. He had treated Louis Napoleon. You know, he... Had all these great stories, but like I said, he sets himself up at, in Whitechapel. Um, and he was also publishing his own biographies at the time. So, oh, was he? Yes. Yeah, so this makes it interesting. I tried to look for these pamphlets and biographies. I could, I found one, but I would have had to order it. It would took a couple of weeks for it to, <laughs> to come. It was a hard copy. Uh, so... This guy was, I guess, pretty infamous and famous. People were reading up on him, and he, so he was producing his own biographies and that. Mm -hmm. And so that's why when he was in London, he he had another one written about him, and he was, you know, trying to set himself up. And so now we're going to talk about that, about that time. Okay, like I said, he's in Whitechapel in May. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're going to quickly go over the, the Ripper timeline. So okay, on August... Okay. 31st, Mary Polly Nichols was murdered. On September 8th, Eliza Ann Smith was murdered. On September 25th, 
the Jack the Ripper letter was sent to the London police. Okay. On September 29th, Elizabeth Stride was murdered. On the 30th of September, Catherine Ed- Edwards, Edwards, it's not Edwards, it's mm. Edwards was murdered. And then go, we're going to jump back to Trumbully. On 7th of November, he was arrested for engaging in a homosexual encounter. Now, this is going to bring up another thing about him. Pretty sure he was he was homosexual. Uh, but I'm going to say a caveat with this. May, him being homosexual has nothing to do with him being a misogynist. That just happened to be two things of his life. Uh, I know plenty of gay men, and I can't think of one that I know personally who's a misogynist. You know, mm-hmm. so to say, and I probably at the time it was a thought, oh, because he's gay, he hates women. But it's really, he's, he's a guy who hates women who also happens to be a homosexual. That's They're far real, more likely to be a uh, yeah. misandrist. Exactly. Hate, hate their own kind. Exactly. You know, looking uh-huh. back at what we know about serial killers now, uh-huh. if you have a homosexual serial killer, they're more li- likely to kill men. Yeah. So uh, we can go into the more this later, but it's just uh, we have to point this out. So he was arrested on this date for that and immediately made bail. Okay. Mm-hmm. But it was a misdemeanor charge. So they had to let him go. And the next night... The last uh, victim of Jack the Ripper that they verified was from Jack the Ripper died. Mary Jane or Gin, uh, Black Kelly or Ginger Kelly was murdered. Mm. So literally he was arrested. He was sitting in down there in Scotland Yard on this misdemeanor and makes bail. Next day, there's another Jack the Ripper murder. Okay, but he's in, he's got to stay in England because he's got to face that the, the trial, right? They got to take him to trial. You know, uh, Oscar Wilde had to go to trial for this. You know, there were all the... Turning, wasn't it? Uh, Aunt, yeah. Alan Turning as well. And that was in the 40s, mm-hmm. 1940s. So, okay, he's going to be facing pretty stiff, you know, trial for this. Uh, on November 20th, he asked his lawyer to have the trial postponed until December. So while his lawyer's working on that, he... Trump, Trumble T goes down to the bank, collects 260 pounds from his bank that was sent over from New York, gets on a steamer and ends up in France on November 23rd, and then heads to another town in France on the next day and jumps on a steamer to go back to the United States. He's back in the United States on December 2nd, 1888, and they can't do anything. It's a misdemeanor. They can't extradite him. He's free. He's got free of the the one thing they did charge him with. Mm -hmm. Now, the next year, Alice McKenzie was killed on July 17th, 1889. And at the time, her death was attributed to Jack the Ripper. Uh, But so when that happened, Trumbull T was taken off the list. And he was, okay, I got to go go back a little bit. He was put on the list as a suspect because of his arrest of the homosexual affair and his constant statements of his hatred for women. So I would say the arrest put him on the radar, but he was his own statements that kind of nailed him onto the suspect board Mm -hmm. because they did state that it was a man who hated women and he was very vocal about that. So there you go. But when... Uh, what what are the uh, possibilities that this uh, lurid encounter mm-hmm. was entrapment? I don't know. That's a good idea. Like I said, there's I, there's some parts of this... They needed some reason to bring him in. Yeah. Uh, so uh, they concocted this entrapment. Just to uh, see, yeah. Yeah, just to... Yeah, just to get him held, just to get him charged with something, mm-hmm. to make sure that you know he doesn't, and that's exactly what he does. He jumps bail. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and uh, well, that's a good, good 
good idea. I mean, mm-hmm. he, he's well known. I mean, he he'd been arrested he, multiple times. He'd been and the police departments have done this. Yeah, you know, since they've been police departments. And he he was known to, you know, bring out those uteruses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I said, that's kind of hearsay because the people who did write about it wrote about it after the Jack the Ripper stuff. Mm-hmm. And they said, oh, yeah, back in the 1860s, I remember at the dinner party, he'd bring out these jars. Yeah. You know, although there is probably one account that was substantiated. Uh, it was a newspaper account from New York City in 1860 in which the reporter noted the specimen jars that were in his uh, Trumbley's office. Didn't say what they were, but did say he had a collection of specimens that were probably more suited for a deranged mind. Yeah. And knowing this guy's background with peddling porn for another doctor, hey, yeah. I mean, let's put our mind hunter hat on here. This is, yeah. Yeah, he's got a lot of check marks going. There are you a know? lot of twists and turns yeah. with this individual, though, and his case. Yeah. They don't, there are characteristics here that don't match. Right, right. Uh, the timeline not to say does. That maybe he, he would. Yeah. The, the timeline does. Yeah. I mean, he was in the area. He did fit their profile. I don't know if you, uh-huh. you could go back now and redo it with what we know now, criminal psychology, and see mm-hmm. if he still fits. Right. Um, he was, they did think that Jack the Ripper had some sort of medical training, and this guy kind of had some medical training, although it was char- charlatan. How did he lay <laughs> hands on the uteruses? I mean, literally. That that's what I was thinking. I mean, there's no proof that there were other like missing women around at the time. Or are these just samples that he had gotten off of snake peddling, uh, other uh, snake oil peddling. Possibly, or he was playing ghouls to get them. And I mean ghouls as the people who dug up the graves Absolutely, for yes. doctors. Yeah, I don't mean yeah. ghouls as the supernatural creature. But no, I mean <laughs> the ghouls that dug up the graves. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's a possibility where he got him too. I'm not the resurrectionist. The resurrectionist, yeah. yeah. I'm not saying he was going around. I'm not saying there was a trail of missing women wherever this guy yeah, was. Exactly. There could be. Nobody's ever looked into it. And the year, well, it's the you know, it's what over a hundred and some odd years trace, now. You would have to trace everything he did to and see if there the were missing he women. Was active, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Where he was, and uh, and then. Use that as a guide to uh, study all the murders that were uh, all those kinds of, of right. things that went on while he was there. Right. You know, it, it, that might be hundreds of cases. Mm-hmm. And you have to sort through all that uh, to, to find out if anything fits. Yep. And whether or not he did kill before he became Jack. Right. You know, if he was Jack. Jack. If he. If he was Jack. Yeah. Uh. But yeah, he was he was named quite early as a suspect, but some people don't think he was. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there are things that don't match up. Like, yeah, he may have hated women, but like you point out, you know, like point out if it's homosexual serial killers usually kill their own kind, the gender. Yeah, they, yeah, they if they're, you know, yeah, they usually kill other gays. Yeah. And uh, be just being a misogynist doesn't necessarily mean you're a serial killer either. Yeah. You know, but yeah, he, he did kind of match. He did do some check marks. And there was this thing about his mustache, which I found hilarious. Now, if you see pictures of this guy, there's a famous picture of this guy. He's dressed in a German uniform and he's got this mustache. Oh, my God. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those big, fluffy, <laughs> huge mustaches. He's you know? putting Bismarck to shame. With he's putting, yeah. Okay. With his mustache. And people are quick to point out that while he was in Whitechapel, he he didn't have that mustache. Uh-huh. And I don't know what that has to do with Jack the Ripper, but that makes some people point out why well, he couldn't be Jack the Ripper because he didn't have that mustache. What? I don't know. I tried to read it, tried to understand the logic of the mustache and why it doesn't make him Jack the Ripper, but I just gave up. All right. Well, you know, he yeah. used facial hair to mm-hmm. really, I don't know, sort of... Break up the possibility of uh, of being identified. You know, to mm-hmm. sort of you know changing your your appearance yeah. uh, from one place once you get into another, and you know, so nobody recognizes right. you there when 
when, when you've crossed the Atlantic and you've gotten over to England, mm-hmm. maybe you know the first thing you do is go to the barbers, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, for a for a change of face. Mm-hmm. Now that way you don't get recognized by anybody you know who might travel abroad. Actually, I'm going to backtrack. I just found the reason why they're going off about the mustache. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you take that picture of him dressed in the German uniform mm-hmm. and that huge mustache. <laughs> The people who say that couldn't have been him being Ripper because the descriptions of the people, the men who were seen with the victims Mm -hmm. prior, don't match him because they had smaller mustaches. Thing was, though, if you look at contemporary accounts of people who knew him and they would describe what he was looking at at the time of the Whitechapel murders, he had a much smaller mustache. Mm -hmm. He didn't always have that huge walrus (laughs) <laughs> on his face, you know. Right. So that's why it was like this mustache thing. I, that's their only reason for discounting him as Jack the Ripper. That's kind of a flimsy thing. Uh-huh. Uh, there are other th- reasons you can discount him, and I kind of yeah. touched upon, you know, psychologically he probably, yeah, he had that straight, he had misogynistic tendencies and mm-hmm. that, but knowing now what we know more about serial killers and that, he probably would not have attacked women. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, he, there were a few people that died under his care, but that's cause he didn't know what the hell he was doing. I mm-hmm. don't think it was malicious. Um, we'll go into that more. Well, he wasn't really a doctor. <laughs> right. Right. But then, so, uh, and then, then he, but he was still pretty good with a knife. Right. He did live in Roch after all this, he did retire to Rochester for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he moved to Baltimore for a bit. Uh, he And then he was in St. Louis in 1903 where he died. But he was interned at the Rochester's Holy Sepulchre Cemetery. So he was and, still practicing his herbal cures up until the point he died. So, oh, dear. <laughs> yes. So that is him in a nutshell. And like I said, they... they you got to admit, it's kind of convincing. He, I think he's one of the more convincing ones I've read about. I'm not a big, I'm not a ripperologist by any means. It's just, you know, one of those famous ones that everybody knows about. And, you know, I watch the, the shows, usually terrible shows, about, you know, that could be this guy, could be that guy. And they always try and sensationalize it was this royal or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, or my favorite is, well, what, what if it was a woman? There's been a few theories right. put that forward that might have been a woman. Uh, but No, I wanted to mm-hmm. focus in on more about uh, the sort of characters that he encountered. Or claimed to encounter? Well, uh, or, <laughs> and one was a Colonel C.S. Dunham. Okay. Now, this has to do with all those sample jars. Right. And the collected medical specimens. Um and Tumblety's uh, possible involvement mm-hmm. in the Jack the Ripper murders, uh, and uh, all, because of all the collected medical specimens, right? Uh, but, but there's scant evidence to suggest that uh, you know the allegation was was true, made by uh, Colonel C. S. Dunham, who himself was a confidence trickster. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that means uh, what a confidence trickster is mm-hmm. is a kind of con man. Right. Uh, That's the short form of the term. And it usually has to do with Ponzi schemes. Mm -hmm. Running Ponzi schemes, pyramids, and uh, false investments. Mm -hmm. They'd come in, gain the confidence of the victim who would give them money, presumably Mm -hmm. for an investment. Right. And that's what they would, you know, they would blast off. They they would take off with the money. Right. And... uh, that's who Colonel C.S. Dunham was, and uh, who only made his claims after the press allegations linking Tumble T to the Whitechapel murders occurred. Mm-hmm. So there's, uh, you know, and, it stinks. Yeah, <laughs> and here's some other uh, things that you got to consider know, that might not put him there. Right. The fact that people who did know him and knew him quite well... Uh-huh. Uh, there was no sign that he had any sadistic tendencies yeah he hated women but at the same token he still treated women with respect he still 
uh, he never showed any, he never showed any, uh, penance for violence. He never, you know, did anything odd. He was just, you know, he was just a guy who served, you know, peddled herbal mixtures. Right. But he was, as one woman said, he was a, he was a land, his, she was his landlady Mm -hmm. and said he was a perfect gentleman. Oh, really? Okay. Um, and then if you actually, like they said that supposedly Scotland Yard had him down as a possible suspect. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, that came, that supposedly came out way after that he was a suspect, but, uh, if they had thought he was a suspect, would they let him make bail? I don't think so. I think they would have I think they raised would have held bail. Him. Yeah, mm-hmm. they would have. They would have held him longer. Uh, so perhaps I, realizing later on right. these other connections and, and saying, "Whoa, wait a minute!" But we got to get this guy back into court. So all the ones who bounces. say that Scott and Yard had him as a suspect, there's mm-hmm. nothing on their official mm-hmm. record. That he was a suspect. Just happened to be, he had been, happened to be arrested. Around At least on the officials. Okay. Yeah. To, to still whet your appetites for, yeah. for you know, researching this. Yeah. Uh, well, allegedly, there's mm-hmm. no official record right. at the time. But there's, you know, that there are records they can't show us. Right. You know, so. But, you know, it's all, but it's been over 100 years, so you think now they could. But anyway, but that's the thing, though. That's if the thing, some very high level people are accused of these crimes. Yeah. And they can't ever let those records be seen by the public. But here's the thing. It'd be a scandal. Like you said, they had him... Even now. They had him in jail. They mm-hmm. had him there. Yeah, they had him dead rights, didn't they? All they had to do is not set a bail. Yeah. Or set uh-huh. it up so high he couldn't make yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. To Says keep them. him there. Right. And if they had him as a suspect. That is a big hole in that theory. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, that, I think, is one of the the biggest holes that, oh, yeah, he was a suspect from the beginning. They had him. Yeah. If he was a suspect from the beginning, why would they have let him go even if he made bail? Yeah, why would they let him out of their hot little hands if they yeah. you know, thought now, they had... Now, some true crime sus- people are screaming one. at their speakers right now because that does happen, though. Mm-hmm. They will get somebody in on a different charge. The police are pretty sure they've done whatever this was. But they have to let him go on that charge. But then they usually are trailing them. Right. They're usually following them. Uh-huh. There was no sign they did that with him. I mean, he was able to kill, get to France and then into the United States. You know, I think yeah. he, once he took off to France, they would have been on his his tail so fast if he was a suspect. But they did nothing. But just how widespread. I mean, they would uh, Scotland Yard would probably have to uh, employ the assistance of the intelligence community. Yeah. I don't know if the Pinkertons they'd, were active at this time, if they would have reached out to the Pinkertons. Yeah, yeah they'd, they'd, know. Have to, they'd have to get the people with the international uh, know-how and authority mm-hmm. in order to trail him. Yeah. And, and they could have, you know, and, and if they were worried about him running, they could have hit him with a larger charge. Exactly. Yes, they hit him with a misdemeanor, mm-hmm. but you got to remember at the time, you know, people's attitudes to... You know, homosexuals was barbaric at that time. Yeah. Surprisingly, he got hit with a misdemeanor. He could have got hit with something harder. I mean, it destroyed Alan Turning's life. Yeah, and that well, was in the 1940s. Exactly. You know, yeah. and so that even surprises me that he got a slap on the wrist for that, too, at that time. But it, I guess it depends, you know, on the circumstances mm-hmm. which he was caught. Yeah. Absolutely. So... Yeah, that's that's him. I mean, they're, they're, phew. I'm sure ripperologists could spend months on this guy. Uh-huh. Um, and it's really, it is a really interesting thing. He does, it, there are a lot of check marks there. But then, at the same token, there's a lot that you could say, well, it, yeah, he just happened to be in the area. Mm-hmm. You know, like I pointed out, those uterus things, yeah, they're gross and kind of weird, but... A lot of think about what a Victorian curiosity cabinet had in it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, right down to the vampire killer kit. Yeah. Which is, well, which well is a that, recent phenomenon. that's recent. Yeah, <laughs> that didn't pop up until the nineties. That's not an actual Victorian thing. That's funny. So we're even separating the fact from the fiction. Yeah. Here. I don't understand. <laughs> so, 
So, so but, yeah. but if you looked at what a curiosity cabinet had, they, they had some odd they stuff. They had some really weird stuff. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, and yeah, granted, some of it was stuff like Fiji mermaids and things like that, you know. Oh, but, of course, or, or, or the odd mm-hmm. uh, preserved uh, yeah. organ, not, not really yeah. all that shocking, maybe. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, like an eye or... So, yeah, he had these specimens, but also... A box with somebody's teeth in it or something right. like that. Right. There were, there were doctors who collected uh-huh. specimens like that. I think we talked about one prior who had a, a, a specimen collection. But he was a legit doctor, so it didn't seem that creepy. Yeah, he, he, could, know. Have, he could have collected uh, these yeah. uh, pickled organs uh, from yeah. either a, a physician, mm-hmm. you know, who was uh, selling specimens. You know, there was no regulation back in the yeah. back in these days from that those these kind of specimens passing from one uh, physician to the other and if he presented himself as a physician which uh, he was trying another, to do during the civil war and, yeah and uh, and you know bought these things mm-hmm. uh, from other sources yeah and then said that they're his specimens well, well okay doctor mm-hmm. how did you acquire them you know whatever you know, nobody, too many more questions, you know, than answers. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, yeah he is kind of a, of a questionable character. He Even is. Even though some people say, well, well, he's a, I guess, a gentleman when it counts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He yeah. was to, in order to keep his room, uh, but. There were other people, though, who said that, too. I mean, that he, mm-hmm. yeah, he had this, he had a weird disposition with some things, but. Mm-hmm. They could not see him brutally attacking and killing somebody. Mm-hmm. There were accidental deaths from him, his negligence, which is bad enough. No, it's murder. You know, yeah. He's, he's it, not even a physician. So. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, he didn't, you know, hack and slash these people. When they died, he took off. <laughs> you know, he he obviously knew he screwed mm-hmm. up and mm-hmm. took off. Uh it was worse if they survived and they had money because they'd go after him and sue us, but, you yeah. know, you know uh, so in his mind, that was worse. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> worse than killing uh, But Yeah, if you're going to, if you're going to hit somebody in the zebra crossing, yeah. you know, finish the job. <laughs> we do not give legal advice here. <laughs> <in our details. laughs> okay. Well, oh, there right. you go. So if, you're into Jack yeah, the Ripper, yeah, and you live in New York. Yes. You might want to go visit the grave of Francis Trumble. Uh, Francis J. Trumble D. Trumble T. Yeah. And if you're a uh, you know, fan of uh, the snake oil salesman, hey, there's another reason to go. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. if you're a fan of mustaches, check his pictures out on the <laughs> Internet. My you're God. Fan of... Fan of big mustaches and pickle hubs. Oh my goodness! Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think I have a. It was like ten inches from end to end. Oh my it was goodness. huge, huge mustache. <laughs> anyway, thank you for listening to our ghastly podcast. Yep. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you for listening to Unearthly Upstate. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Patreon, and on our webpage. We are also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Sprecher. Stitcher, Podbean, Google Podcast, and Castbox. Please like, share, and view on your favorite platform. Unearthly Upstate is an animator liar production. The show is produced by Mari and Matt Manette, with purring provided by Honey and Lloyd. Research and writing by Mari Manette. Music is by Kevin McCloud, licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Unless otherwise stated in the episode, the places mentioned in the broadcast are not paid or contact us for any type of promotion. Please check out our webpage for credit and sources for the episode. Thank you.